Alex, you've got this incredible pergola that's new since the last time I was here. And you found a nursery who you were friends with in town, you worked with. They got a business for that particular location. And they had this pergola that you kind of brought to your place. Yeah, you know, they were they were closing the nursery down. I, I saw the, the pergola. I asked, hey, what are you gonna do with this? I wanna sell it. And so I was able to buy it. It was put together as a kid. Whoever mm -hmm. whoever put this up did a really nice job. So already pre-cut, already pre-drilled, marked. Yeah, every and you know, I just took it apart. It uh, it had been up for a couple of years, and this is one of the things that when when you're doing things in your own landscape, you need to recognize when when you go to Home Depot or someplace and you buy the lumber, mm -hmm. it's more than likely going to be green, which means it was cut, it was processed, it was shipped, and mm -hmm. now you're working with it, so it's very wet. Yeah, as it's wet like that, as it as it dries out it can change it can what what's called a check which can be a crack into it yeah. or it can twist you'll, you'll even be out in your garden you'll hear it happening you can and this was just amazingly straight it had been up for a few years so it was nice and dry we brought all the pieces uh back here to flower street mm -hmm. we power washed it um because I didn't really like the tone of it uh, and it was just dirty from being out in the elements and not really being taken care of so we power washed it and then I because it was so dry I was able to put on three really heavy coats of boiled linseed oil mm. uh, you actually boiled the oil yourself no you buy it that way okay now boiled linseed oil it's it's basically like a cooking oil so and it's all natural you can get that on your hands it would be no different than getting um, uh, Olive oil on your hands. Yeah. However, the one thing that you do need to be careful with it, if you do use rags or anything like that, you do not want to dispose that in an enclosed container. Why? Because it is, it generates a lot of exothermal, uh, exothermic uh, properties with it, mm. which means it's self-heating and mm. it can ignite. Oh my God. In the, so if you put it over in a very flammable part of your yard, it could actually spontaneously combust and light that corner on fire. Well, if it's in a container and yeah. a closed area, like if, it's open, if it's open, it okay. will, and it happened to me, I had a couple of the rags wadded up and and because we use that with our gardens a lot and yeah. I had a couple of rags, uh, just kitchen rags wadded up and I came out and they were smoldering <laughs> and they were black. So anybody oh that God. wants to use it, it can be a very great product to use, but that end, you don't want to throw those old rags in your trash until they dry out. And as it evaporates, all of that exothermic stuff will go away. And as long as it's open to the air, it won't heat up. But if you do enclose it or throw it in a trash can uh, mm. where it's not getting it can't evaporate naturally. It can Could you spontaneously compost it? combust. Um, I wouldn't. I hope we don't have any arsonists watching my channel and they're thinking, hmm, that's a way I can actually light something on fire and be very far away <laughs> when it does. Yeah, so let's let's don't give anybody any ideas. <laughs> exactly. Well, behind us we have your beautiful vertical gardens. Let's go check them out. I'm a little injured today in my foot, but I'm gonna test out this, the structural ability of this guy. And Alex, this doesn't even move. Yeah, not even a little bit. It's solid, you know, we put it together, uh, you know, and really got the footings in properly. Everything's good and level, and those beams are, they're not going anywhere. It is probably the best pergola I've seen of all the gardens I've been to. So great purchase and great way to reuse materials. Yeah, I mean, who knows what this could have ended up in, in the dump someplace. Yeah, and it looks beautiful in your property. Yeah. Alex, I love your place because not only you're growing in raised beds, you're growing fruit trees, you're growing vertically with vines and things like that. You're experimenting. You have mature date palms and pecans here, but you also are growing up the wall of your house. Yeah. Um, Flower Street Urban Gardens is all about these vertical gardens. Tell me about them. We have a different video we did last year that has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views and your vertical gardens are very impressive. So tell us about them briefly here. Well, this one here is the one that started it all. This is me uh, designing this in the backyard. So this one's been up for about five years. And, and the whole thing was, is I, my father, many of you know that follow us, my father moved in with us about five years ago and right. I wanted to create a hobby for him. Okay. He's a retired disabled vet. He can't bend over. I had a perfect wall I felt for a vertical garden. You have engineering experience. I have design background. And so 
I decided, you know what, I'm going to do this. It came together in a process of a, a couple of weekends, really, mm -hmm. and it just really works. Um, and Without any screws or anything, correct? Well, there are screws to mount the brackets oh, right. into, the, into the wall. So the wall of the house is here, you mount the metallic uh, brackets onto the wall, Yep. and then you slide the boards in. The boards just I'll slide into it and then also we we manufacture which is one of those things that is it seems really simple but one of these processes is is really difficult and it's the liners it's an agricultural food grade liner you'll see this a lot if you're yeah, following agriculture it can be uh, this is what they put in strawberry fields you see the mounds yeah I've and then the that. strawberries come up through a material very much like this they cut so little it, holes in it for the strawberries exactly and so this can be exposed to the UV for multiple years why uh, is this important to have in these in these raised beds well if not you could never Ever do this because the soil would fall out I see. Uh, it would stain and damage the walls there's no there's no water that gets onto the wall because of the design of this but this liner we have to we have forms that we custom cut those mm -hmm. we put the the drainage portals in which took us a lot of time to figure out how big those drainage holes need to be if they're too big it drains too quickly if they're too small it drains too slowly mm -hmm. so to, to figure all that out and then we we have special tools and equipment that we use to heat weld them together. Hmm. So it basically, it's an enclosed liner with drainage ports at these areas. So when it drains out, it will um, make it sure that it stays within the unit. So whatever it's on, it will not get wet. And you had them stacked in a way where the top one will water into the next one and next one. And then on the ground, you just plant things in the earth. Exactly. So you're actually using the water very efficiently. And it's not going to rot the house because... Because not, none of that gets wet. Because you have this liner against the back part of it as well. Exactly. And when it drains out in these areas, what happens is the water could drain and it could get behind the liner mm -hmm. or behind the wood. But this ensures that when it drains out of these drainage ports here, that it stays inside. And what's really great, when we first do an installation, we put a slow release organic fertilizer in every level. But from that moment forward, what we tell our customers customers to do and what we practice here is we only put the fertilizer on the top level oh because it's basically going to run a compost tea through the unit right and so all those nutrients from the top level will end up in these lower levels so where trickle-down economics might not work in American society <laughs> It is working for your vertical gardens. It can, it does in vertical gardens. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. And tell us some of the plants you have on the top layer today. You have Swiss chards, lemongrasses, all kinds of stuff up there. We have all kinds of, yeah, around around here. It's primarily Swiss chard and uh, the lemongrass. Um, and what we like to do with this is because it's higher, you know, we want to have things that can easily be harvested there without having a ladder. Mm -hmm. Then we just taken out some, some lettuce that we had consumed and put some more lettuce in. This is a really cool, interesting plant. It's, uh, and you probably tasted this before. It is um, Mexican mint. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's very nice. I like that. That has an amazing... It's almost like minty licorice combination. It is. It has To me, it has a very strong licorice taste to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's great in garnishments. Um, it's, it's just a fantastic product. Now, also in this application, one of the things that in our other beds, if you look in the bed behind us over there, that one wasn't protected. It got a cold snap. But what's unique about this is it gets the warmth off the house. So we still have... So tomatoes elsewhere in your property have taken a hit from the frost, but these ones are still going strong. And it's January 15th or something today. Yeah. That's amazing. And so, so in this, it, there's microclimates sort of within microclimates when you're doing vertical gardening like this. That's the best tomato I ever had in my entire life. <laughs> Really? Of course. <laughs> they, they, they are fantastic. I mean, the soil is really nutrient dense. What we recommend with these gardens when we're gardening like this is we still do the no-till. Yeah. You know, and you can see in here where I've cut plants out and planted around it as we replace things. And as the soil level, the volume drops, we just top it off with a really good organic compost. That had, probably has 
rock dust and worm castings in it. And All of like those things are in there. Plus, one of the things is uh, what we're doing too is we install the very sophisticated, but it can be very affordable system here mm -hmm. as far as the irrigation is concerned. And you can see one of these right here. This is the same thing we did for the Arizona Diamondbacks at Chase Field. Yeah, we've shown you in video installing the these vertical gardens on the outside of the Diamondback Stadium. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that you didn't see is this little sensor here. Yeah, let's check it out. This is a soil sensor. Maybe a moisture Toro. sensor it's a Toro this is wireless okay and it connects to our controller which is the Toro evolution timer which is outside the house or in the house it's outside the house but okay. it can be put really anywhere okay it has a uh, it's connected to the Wi-Fi. I can turn any of these gardens on from anywhere in the world with your phone with my phone okay so this is monitoring the moisture levels in your soil it's sending that data to the, you, you call it the command the center, controller to the controller or timer. And then you get a analytics or readout probably through an app on your phone. Yep. And then you can also turn it on and off or probably time it. With exactly. Oh but God. what's really important about this is you set it up. That's cool. Because now during the middle of January, it doesn't require the same amount of water as mm -hmm. it does during the middle of June. Yeah. So this, I set the controller to send water over here every day. But before it does that, the controller asks the timer. How's like, the moisture? Uh, it, it asks the sensor and it says, hey, I'm about to send you water. Do you need it? If the sensor replies no, then it says, okay, I'll check with you tomorrow. Or maybe it's raining. Maybe it's raining. And then it won't because one of my biggest pet pieces is when it's raining outside and you drive down some properties watering their grass because they didn't adjust their timer. You now have the ability to do that without even controlling it through well, the sensor. It's really important and because again, we're here and we have flood irrigated property, but right. I like green grass. I like pretty. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have these soil sensors in the lawn as well. Wow. So when we get the flood irrigation throughout the summer, mm -hmm. there's times that we don't, the irrigation just never comes on, mm -hmm. but when it needs it, then it will come on. Hmm. Uh, so all of that kind of stuff is set up automatically. It's affordable system. What's really great about this Toro Evolution system, it comes as a, a basic four station controller. Mm -hmm. And then you can purchase and add these different modules on it for the hmm. Wi-Fi. They do have a, a weather station that you could apply to it. But here in Phoenix, I didn't feel that the weather station was really that important to me. Yeah. The soil sensor was what was really important. That's and great. you have to use one or the other so in certain areas of the country maybe the weather station is going to be best but for for these applications I have the same soil sensors on the street as well so everything is automatic and then plus we have uh, and uh, you may want to see this this injection fertilization system so you show us the Diamondback Stadium but you have one here as well I have one here so because you're installing these vertical gardens for people, businesses, restaurants, the Diamondbacks, anybody who wants them. Yeah. Um, but you're also feeding fertilizer, liquid organic fertilizer into the irrigation line. Yeah. Let me see that. Let's see it. 